Um, this talk kind of came from, I suppose, a combination of things. I, I don't want to convey myself as an expert of, of consultation, just someone who's worked at it for years, because I find that it truly changes the way decisions can be made in a very beautiful, magical process. One that often business people don't think about by default. Often business people are not inclined to do something that's um, as diverse and, and uh, compassionate as something like true consultation. And over the last 20 years, as, as, as she was saying um, in my intro, I've worked at various places in the corporate legal environment. And it's only recently in the last uh, four years that I've worked in a nonprofit organization, which is quite exciting because to be in a mission-based organization is so uplifting because it's not just about quarterly revenues and meeting the bottom line. So I had 16 years of that experience and I know what that's like. And it can be really um, draining because people are looking to um, meet their goals, but from a very myopic perspective, whether it's sales, manufacturing, business development, whatever they're doing, it's all aiming to grow the bottom line. And what I think is interesting is, is even when you're in that environment, sometimes you have, you know, human beings in a room that need to decide something. And I have found kind of surprisingly, as I, as I kind of continued my career in various places, that when you can inspire people to contribute and to be honest and authentic, it changes the nature of how decisions can be made. And it's really, it's really feasible in a corporate environment to do so. You just have to find the bravery and the courage and you have to bring it up, not like, okay, everyone's gonna do this. It has to be out of love and encouragement. Um, so what I'm going to go over today is kind of taking threads of what I've learned over time about both what consultation as a definition is and also how I've presented it to business people. So this is not only going to be where consultation came from, but I do want to kind of describe that. I also want to describe some spiritual principles that for me was really important to rely upon to actually conduct a consultative mm, atmosphere, I, I should say. Um, because I think if you don't have certain spiritual principles, it's very difficult to speak and people really believe your heart, you know? Because if you're, if you're talking from just your head, they'll hear you from your head. But if you can talk from your heart, then things start to change. So we'll talk a little bit about consultation the definition the the spiritual principles that it's based on or at least that i followed and how it helped me to to pivot and then also talk about really breaking down a model and this is a really um you know consultation comes from really a paragraph written back in 1908 1911 um, abdul baha the son of baha'u'llah the founder of the faith of the baha'i faith talked about this really unique approach of connecting with people and it comes from a place of how do you interconnect diversity? How do you bring people together from all races, classes, and economic backgrounds um, to really connect? And the Baha'i Faith's uh, goal is to really connect oneness of humanity. So it has a really cool formula to actually get there, right? So consultation was described back in early 1900s, and I'm going to talk about that. And then we're going to go into this other model that was developed by Dr. K. Von Gula out of California, a nine-step process that I've actually introduced to my companies and talked to them about it and has been used in workshops and business meetings um, going forward. And people have found it to be useful. Um, and then we'll talk about a topic that is very close to my heart. It's about racial uh, issues and racism because I think that in order to start in a place of consultation, you also have to find a point of vulnerability. And we haven't solved racism, we haven't solved it. So I think that these two short videos present us a, an issue that we can discuss. I also wanna say that certainly within the whole thing, because we have this nice virtual process, please feel free to chat questions. We'll go through that. We have a small enough group that we can absolutely absolutely involve you and whatever issues that you'd like to discuss or raise uh, or questions, I'm happy to go through. 
okay? And certainly another point, you all have amazing experience yourself, I'm sure. So if you have things that you'd like to share with the rest of the group of ways that you have been able to break through the barriers in getting people really to consult, I'd love to hear it. Okay, so I'm gonna so uh, the art of consultation. I call it the art um, because I think that's what it is. It's not something that you can just um, implement. It really takes um, a suspension, if you will, of heart and mind to really get there. And we'll talk about how it incorporates compassion, inclusion, and diversity into the process of decision making. So this is one of the quotes that have helped me kind of think about how decision making is done today versus maybe a new way of doing it. So there's guidance from the Universal House of Justice, which is a governing body of the Baha'is, and they write letters um, to Baha'is and, and other people of the world about what's going on. So one of their letters talked about the fact that humanity is gripped by a crisis of identity as various peoples and groups struggle to define themselves, their place in the world, and how they should act. And a second quote, that there is no justification for continuing to perpetuate structures, rules, and systems that manifestly fail to serve the interests of all people. Now, just to reflect on that for a moment, I wanted to start with this because I think the very first barrier that we have to face in decision making is that there's another way that it's done. It's done in the cultural format of the company or the community or the level of engagement that you're in. And it's done in a way that may not represent the best process. And to me, this gives me hope that both people aren't satisfied with where we are and that we don't need to just continue the old systems. So another principle relates to justice, which again, this is really inspiring to me because I try to have, you know, I, I didn't grow up as a Baha'i, I grew up as a Muslim, and I found that in entering college, this was something that served, I'd say, as my moral compass when I, when I researched it. And this is something that's really helped me in the area of law <laughs> because justice is talked about all the time. But justice from the definition of lawyers or law, to me, has become a little bit uh, altered and um, reframed. And when I look at this definition, you know, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes and not through the eyes of others, and shalt know of thine own knowledge and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. I mean, this is about critical thinking, right? This is about understanding knowledge from your own perspective and not just because someone else told you. And that upended my view of justice because justice in the United States at least, is built on other people's opinions. <laughs> it's literally built on a body of work of case law that gets built as a, as a foundation. And the more cases you have in a particular principle, the more you rely on it. So lawyers are yet, even though they're told to analyze the issue critically, they're often, in a, they have a muscle in which they're used to just relying on whatever's there. So finding a lawyer who really will critically think independently is actually hard to find because the propensity is to just do what others are doing. And I think that aligns with business. It aligns with every field that, that sometimes we don't look at things on our own. And I think that's an important principle because in order to consult, you have to really think about your own viewpoint. You can't just align yourself with the ideas in the room just because they say it, just because they're your boss, just because they sound really convincing. You have to see it. And if you look at the beginning, of course, again, it has a spiritual component, but it's really beautiful because it says, if you turn to it, right? Because it says, turn not away. So if you turn towards it, 
then you will be confided in. You know, it's almost suggesting that we'll get the answer <laughs> if we really look within ourselves. And I think that's very inspiring about how to make and how to face these types of things. Um, the next one is spiritual awareness. So again, we've talked a lot about this in redefining success, right? Um, this is now becoming a theme that I think everyone has heard, incorporated, and, and views. So um, spiritual awareness, of course, relates to knowing that we also have spiritual progress in addition to material progress, right? The last sentence of the first uh, verse, you know, only by improving spiritually as well as materially can we actually make any real progress and become perfect beings. And then in a, in a, in a document that was published by the Baha'i International Community, which is the non-governmental organization representing the Baha'is, you know, a true prosperity, a, wealth, a well-being founded on peace, cooperation, altruism, dignity, rectitude of conduct and justice which flows from the light of spiritual awareness and virtue as well as from material discovery and pro progress right so there has to be these principles of cooperation and altruism and dignity how many meetings are characterized that way how many how many discussions to find answers are characterized that way and i think it's a good bar for us to set that if we are going to be able to safeguard the ways that we want to interact, that we look to certain principles, we look to certain bars to, to evaluate where, where we are and to hope that we are closer to those standards. And of course, this to me is, is also one of the largest principles that's important because when we're interacting with different types of people, whether they're from a different culture, different race, different background, or certainly coming from a different uh, role within the company, being compassionate and knowing that if they can't find a truth, so here it's show forbearance and benevolence and love, you know, truly showing love to one another, you know, that's not easy to do in a business setting. What does that really mean and how do we translate that? But one practical impact is by saying, should one of you be incapable of grasping a certain truth or striving to comprehend it, show forth when conversing with him a spirit of extreme kindliness and goodwill. What a beautiful, beautiful way to put that, right? Help him to see and recognize the truth without esteeming yourself to be in the least superior to him or to be possessed of greater endowments. And again, <laughs> that could not be farther than CEOs and C-suite organizations where someone will just say, this is the way it is. And you agree to it because I'm your manager, right? So there's, there's many elements which this, I think, again, challenges us to think about. And whilst I'm not necessarily proposing that every single interaction will have these qualities. Can you imagine how beautiful it was if we did? So a case for a new methodology. So these principles, thinking about it in a more practical format and really evaluating the possibility, to me, I believe consultation is this beautiful, magical formula because as we'll find out in the definition, debate and propaganda and the adversarial method, which is when you know two parties will argue, like in a court of law, for example, and the one who's more effective wins. I can't tell you how much there's a there's a book called Just Mercy that was just made into a movie about someone who was put on death row in Alabama. And he didn't have any defense. He didn't have anyone to represent him. And certainly he had a very easy path to go from, you know, a crime that was committed that he didn't commit and then being sentenced to a death sentence. You bring in a good lawyer and the completely thing reverses. So it can't be that adversarial methods actually get down to the truth of a situation, right? It's just whoever's more effective will, will win. Um, Likewise, how do we find the wisest choice 
among the options at any given moment, right? Um, when does respect and justice actually apply to our process? And how can we truly work in diversity? So how is it possible if you are in a room with people you don't have a true understanding about their culture, about the, the oppression that they may have gone through, can you really understand where they're coming from just by the words that they say? Don't we have to feel like we can validate them? Don't we have to really reach out and bridge the differences? So how do we engage with heart? So that's where this idea of having a new concept is introduced. So this definition, again, came from a letter or a talk, actually, that Abdul Baha gave in Paris in about, I believe it was 1911 or 1912, about this new idea to create a way of interaction. And it's one, it was long, one long paragraph, but I broke it down in a couple of steps. So consultation must have for its object the investigation of truth. Now that is one difference from debate, adversary. People don't necessarily go to court to find the truth. They go to court to try to establish justice, right? People in a business meeting are not always looking for the right answer, but they're looking for an answer <laughs> to expedite. Uh, there's a number of models, but I think it's quite beautiful to say and to suggest we're actually looking for the truth. And then again, bringing back the basis of this compassion, he who expresses an opinion should not voice it as correct and right, but set it forth as a contribution to the consensus of opinion, for the light of reality becomes apparent when two opinions co coincide. So again, there's this interesting formula here, and I don't know if there's some scientists or mathematicians in our group, but to me, this is basically saying, you know, reality will only be there if there's a clash, right? And what's interesting is at work, when I used to bring this up, I used to say to people, you know, guys, I want people to kind of contribute and I want you to contribute not just to agree with me, not just to agree with the concept, but really bring differing opinions, like purposely try to find what is else out there. Uh, because the, really it's like the cream at the top, right? Once you have a number of different discussions and you have the wisdom of everyone in the group, the best ideas really do rise to the top. So then of course this, this metaphor, right? A spark is produced when flint and steel come together. Right? And we know that flint, the characteristics of flint, are very different from steel. I don't know enough about the chemistry or whatever the physics of that at all, but we can imagine what that means. So flint, imagine in a business setting, maybe the, you know, the person who's on the field working with customers, understanding something, and, and, and the steel may be the CEO, right? however it works, but something will happen if you have a combination and it will be something that wasn't there before, right? So everyone's preconceived ideas are not the ones that actually result, it's actually in this combination. So of course, man should weigh his opinions with the utmost serenity, calmness and composure. And I'll tell you right now, I'm a hypocrite with that because it's very hard for me to do that. I have tried many times in meetings to just be like, okay, and now here's another option. We could do it this way too. It's very hard because for me, I'm a really passionate person. That's my personality. So I have heard, and this is interesting feedback, I have heard from people that when I present something, automatically people wanna easily just agree because I have the energy behind what I'm saying and it makes it weightier right? Particularly in America where this is a culture that goes with the most you know, um, you know, uh, energy and that kind of thing. This is a culture that really appreciates the person who walks in the room with the idea, right? But it's important that we push it back a little bit because we realize that that may not be the right answer. So I've been training on that and working on that. And then of course, before expressing his own views, carefully consider the views already advanced. What is that saying? It's like, listen, 
don't just wait to say what you need to say, right? Actually incorporate what you heard first. And again, that's, that's totally different than what I think we often are falling into the trap of, of just, okay, mm -hmm, okay, he's talking, okay, he's giving his view. All right, now I'm going to give my view. No, 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 like take it in, right? Take it in, absorb, listen, and reflect, really reflect. Then if he finds that a previously expressed opinion is more true, he should accept it immediately and not willfully hold to an opinion of his own. By this excellent method, he endeavors to arrive at unity and truth, right? So I don't need to say anything about that because I think it's clear. So what are the characteristics of consultation? So similar to what we just talked about in the definition, this is where individual participants really want to transcend their respective points of view. The collective wisdom is actually more important than each individual. The atmosphere is characterized by candor and courtesy. And when sharing ideas, they don't belong to the individual to whom they occur, but actually to the group. And it succeeds to the extent that all participants share, support the de decisions that are arrived at. Regardless of the actual opinions, and this is interesting because I think it's very typical for after a meeting to happen, once a decision has been made, for people to talk about it afterwards, like, oh, I, did, I can't believe that Linda brought this up, or I can't believe that, you know, we had this issue, or at least that's something that happens in some business frameworks where people get annoyed and maybe carry resentment about a particular decision. The idea behind this consultative process is to really make sure that everyone agrees to then take it forward and support it 100%, 100%, 100%—right? That's, again, another component that makes decision making very different because you can trust that what you say is actually truly what people are thinking, right? So it requires a certain level of candor. Um, and then these are the nine steps, the, the toolkit, if you will, that um, was summarized by a counselor out of California. She's an actual really incredible uh, family counselor that brings in spirituality into her consultations. And actually, when I looked up consultation in the dictionary, it actually refers to a physician with a patient, you know, to try to provide a diagnosis. Um, so I thought it was interesting that it also, you know, this kind of uh, idea of working together to find a solution may have come from that. But in essence, these are the nine steps. And there's a card that I would have given you guys personally, which we can send you a Word doc that actually contains these nine steps um, that in the right hand side, you'll see this little symbol. So to me, that's just a, a hint that the first thing you have to do is stick a tack in it. Like you have to get the facts out, which is establish your purpose of why you're there, establish unity of why everyone is there identify the, and define the issues cordially, gather the facts. So that's like the thumbtack. Then you have three elements of consultation that really go with the heart. What are the principles that guide your decisions? What are your wants, intentions, and hopes? And then brainstorm, right? You really need to have a creative sense of energy there. And you do have to look at what you really hope to do. I think often this is one big skipped process in companies because companies often know the facts and the issues and then they get to the outcome, but they don't actually stop and think what would be ideal, right? What would be the best way to do this? Because sometimes that's not viewed as practical, but if you incorporate that, then it does change a little bit. Again, this is an art. It does change the outcome a bit because maybe another way to address it is then introduced. Um, and then of course the flag, this metaphor of put a flag in it, it's there, it's set, you can't change it. <laughs> you choose actions by consensus or majority vote. You support the decision wholeheartedly in the spirit of uni unity and humility. And then there's an interesting point where you also evaluate it. So for example, consultation, just like decision making in, a, in, in one sense, when you make a decision, you, you come to a conclusion, but have you evaluated whether des the decision was right or wrong? And in later meetings that you have, for example, 
if it comes up, you can evaluate what happened and how did it go and was it the right solution? Because if we're humble enough to remember what we did wrong, we'll have more uh, informed decision about the next one down the pike, right? Without blame, without any of those things. Um, and it's and it's an important component. Um, I really appreciate the way that you've kind of you know laid this consultation process out, you know, especially in some of the language that you've chosen to use that I think would work in a corporate environment as well as in you know a more spiritual environment. And you know the aspect of it that I think is almost always missing in consultation and even, even in Baha'i consultation among assembly members um, is the skipping of that spiritual component and you know, what are the values you know, that apply here? What are the spiritual you know, values and stuff like that? Um, and it seems to be really hard in, with, in, in that context when you know, we have a wealth of information about what our values are and how we want to address things and what are the principles that really apply. You know, when you get to a, a, a more of a business environment, identifying what those you know, values are can be a little bit more challenging. How have you um, managed to identify what those values are? You know, for example, even in the legal, legal, legal system or within, uh, you know, with, within TED, because you know, in the legal system, like I said, it's not necessarily the values of the system in the US aren't really finding truth, but it's you know, getting, you know, potentially just you know, getting the win. And so that would probably be the top value in some law firms. Basically, said we just want to win no matter what. I, I'll share two examples. Um, the first example was in a corporate environment. The second one is is at TED. Um, so I was at this company called CA Technologies. We were a Fortune 500 technology company, sold about four billion dollars of software and mainframe stuff per year. And one of the things that I noticed um, within our structure, or we noticed, we have 165 lawyers across the world, sell in each country. And when the original legal teams years before me came on board and other people, they had had legal paperwork that looks like legal paperwork, which means very single-minded, unilateral, only for one side, um, makes really tough negotiations each time. And we had to close about 300 deals per month. And it was really, really excruciating to have to negotiate and push. But our approach was, we're the big guys. You're not. Too bad. And one of the interesting moral and spiritual consequences of that is we lost a lot of respect because people didn't want to deal with someone who's like that even if we were the Fortune 500 company who were the only ones who had the secure and governing software that everyone needed for their mainframes, they didn't like us. And one of the efforts that we decided to look at is when we were looking at new paperwork, which was a big pet project of mine because I believe that legal can be very clear, very concise. And in fact, when I first took a class in legal writing after as a practicing lawyer, it was a seminar the guy was great. He said, the first thing he said is the best legal writing is when it doesn't look legal. I was like, yes, <laughs> which was so refreshing because you're taught in law school to write, th you know, my, my professor used to say, let's write the 300 letter words now, $300 words, because you want to look so arrogant that no one can touch you. That's the secret, right? So surprise, surprise, it ain't real true, okay? <laughs> We're not special and genius or anything. We just like to use big words because it makes us happy. Um, anyway, so we changed the nature of these agreements. And it was really interesting because some of the lawyers were like, I don't think we need to do this. No reason. These work. People need to sign it. So why spend time and money to get through all of this? And one of the principles that we discussed was what is our goal towards our shareholders of our community? What's our goal and do we wanna be known as the big evil Borg software company that just requires everything? And it was really interesting because once we got to the principle level, then we were able to administer a different type of answer. And we ended up doing a survey. I mean, this took work. We ended up surveying about 150 customers and asked them who already had agreements in place with us, 
who didn't necessarily want to renegotiate. And we asked them, would you be open to getting new paperwork if it was mutual, respectful, easy to use, modular, blah, blah, blah. And we had an overwhelming majority saying, yes, please. <laughs> Don't torture us anymore. We want something better. And the salespeople and the finance people and the other people who were so concerned couldn't say anything, right? Because we brought facts to them that relied upon principles that were important that I personally think were more closer to the truth, right? Whereas their view of the truth was that it didn't make a difference. So there is where a principle can help establish something. You still have to maybe do some work to convince them objectively because they just didn't listen. I'm like, just listen to what I'm saying. I know this is true. And they didn't care. <laughs> They're like, no, sorry, Nishat, whatever. Um, so we got that. And so another case, another example at TED, so we had this really, um, we hold these large conferences each year. It's a flagship conference. It's in Vancouver. And there are about 2,000 people who come together. Now, the conference is really the way that TED fundraises for its own uh, establishment. So we're a nonprofit. Uh, we don't charge money for people to hear TED Talks online. It's all done free. But at these conferences, we charge a heavy donation amount. So it's about $25,000 a ticket. 3,000 of which go to the conference, 25,000 or 10,000 goes to the actual donation to TED. So people who can afford that are quite privileged. We're talking about privilege of the privilege of the privilege, right? We're talking about billionaires, heads of state, prime ministers, movie stars, people who want to investigate great ideas, but they have a very uh, siloed world. Their bubble is really different than any of our bubbles, right? Just different lifestyle. So during this conference, we found out, and we had a share about maybe 40% women, 60% men in a combination, that certain people were not ex experiencing the same experience. Some people would go in and feel super excited, really love it, five days and nights together. Other people will come away feeling oppressed, discriminated against, maybe feeling harassed may have been just a handful of people, but the view was, that's not acceptable. Why are people getting harassed? What's happening? Now, in a conference setting, from a legal perspective, you don't have an employer-employee um, responsibility. So you're not really responsible for what happens to people at the conference, technically. But should we be responsible? Because we wanna make sure that everyone enjoys the atmosphere in full curiosity and in a spirit of kindliness and friendliness and everything. So we ended up discussing, even though legally you don't have to, and many of my legal colleagues from other organizations said, don't touch it because they said, you'll, you'll make yourself liable for risks. We believed it was right. And the way we managed it was having a very strict and defined code of conduct an investigative process. So if anything happens on site, you can report it anonymously and then to do the investigations on site while you're there. And the consequences were you're kicked out, no refund, you have to leave. And the consequences were we showed that we were doing something about it. Now this has been covered by newspapers and other places as being really forward thinking because we wanted to be involved. And we felt the principle of being equitable to everyone who experienced it was really important. And now it's being used by Skoll, by Sundance, by other organizations around the world who now also want to shift the way that they're managing it because they realize when people get together, it should be truly equitable for everyone involved. So that was a problem that, again, legally, it could have been expedient about it and just say, forget it. It's too bad. So sad. They have to deal with it. They can go home. And one of the colleagues I spoke to, by the way, um, of a different organization, which I won't mention, they said, you know, if something happens, they call the cops. We don't, we want to be this far away from it. But if you have harassment and discrimination, or you have these feelings of, of, of um, inequity and you truly do care, and this is what being in a mission organization is so important, at least from that perspective, 
it means the world to everyone. So we did make the steps and we have changed it. And it's been luckily an example for other organizations as well. So that kind of gives a little bit of what happens in these situations where you want to go with the principle, not necessarily the, the practical or easy way. There's a, a question that I have about introducing consultation in, in, in the work environment. And what is your experience with seeing it as a process? Because I've seen people trying <laughs> and installing it and being disappointed that it didn't work. <laughs> So how did it start? How did it evolve? What were some characteristics of maturity that you saw emerging? Can you share a bit of that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I introduced this in two or three different categories. One was um, at CA when the lawyers got together to redo this huge project. And there was actually a paper published on that, <laughs> on that where we actually talk about how we did it. Six lawyers from different countries coming together to really find the right unique approach. Um, and what I found at TED was we did a workshop on consultation and the funny thing was when I talked about it and introduced it, there was one group at TED that was super excited about implementing it. And they, and they wrote me and they said, can I get the book? I want to know. And it was the tech team. And it was so surprising to me because I'm thinking, you know, intellect, heart, like, you know, like, how are we going to do this for our customers? And it was the tech team and they felt it was so radical because they have this structure, I think, and I'm assuming this, but the structural way of thinking of brainstorming and then coming up with tech ways for the user interface, how to do it in a good way. And they have often 20 to 25 people in a room. And so when they came to me and they said, look, we really want to implement this. It was so humbling. And I was so like, what? That's so cool. So I think, you know, the way I do it literally is there is this card that has like the nine steps of consultation, a couple of characteristics of it, and then reflections on the back. And it's funny because the reflections three or four of them come from TED Talks. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're just inspiring kind of thoughts about why do we need to get there from heart. And I think it's a combination of knowing the practical and giving an inspiring bar to get to. And of course, one of the ways that companies face this is because their current decision making isn't working, right? Not everyone feels that things are positive, productive, or inspiring, or frankly, something's not working. So in those situations, I think it's a great way to introduce it. And as you said, it is a process. It is definitely not something that can change people overnight, because frankly, it's really hard work to do this. It's easy to think about your own view and then present it, but very hard to really actually incorporate everyone's views and think about it in that way, and then to be let go of your own thoughts that you've worked on, that you thought was ideal, you know, to really absorb everything else. So it's, it's quite a hard process, but I have found business people, skeptical people, tech people, a number of them, as we introduce it as, this is something we could do, we could try. And that also allows a little more flexibility because I'm not suggesting it's right, it's just another way of doing it. And we actually introduced it to our community in our town because we're doing these things called, um, you know, community conversations. And we're talking about issues that our town are facing from a social economic development standpoint, whether it's racism or inequality or poverty and talking about it using this as a process. And the most important thing is to make sure that the facilitator or the person who's in the group of let's say eight to 10 really understands it and can introduce it with love, right? I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with, you know, when you attend a class and you get really super excited because the teacher who walks in can just spark your ideas and it's so inspiring. You walk away with so much more compared to someone who's just reading it. Yeah, let's establish unity of vision right now. Okay, <laughs> that's not going to go. So one has to really be folded into it full full heart, I think, uh, before it can be implemented successfully. And actually, you, especially your, your card with like these steps that you um, that you established here, when you presented them initially, I already kind of, 
it clicked in my mind to, okay, this sounds a little bit like agile development or scrum. I'm, I'm not in the development I, uh, software business, but I'm, I'm learning about this. But I kind of re resonated with me. And now you said this with the tech team. <laughs> so I, I thought maybe just uh, has any, anyone recognized that before? Have you ever gotten that kind of feedback? That, that was one thing? Because that would help also to like connect it to the business and the like tech in world that I'm in, if you if there are relationships. Um, and the other one is um, this this uh, underlying uh, intention um, that you just also said about introducing this concept of love and being in the end more successful with that if it's from the bottom of your heart and, and introduced with love. Now again, this could be something you can try to convince people that love is really an, an amazing tool <laughs> that they should use uh, to be more successful and to, to get more out of it. So I think, but that that's not the love you're talking about. So how do you, <laughs> have you experienced yeah. that and how to avoid this, this trap of, okay, love is just another management tool that you can apply, <laughs> um, like all the other ones, you know, that people don't get this, this misconception. You know, I, I know it's, it's a little funny, but, um, I, I'd like, you know, I have colleagues that I'd like to tell them, okay, you are a great tech guy and you have great ideas. Be more loving when you do presentations. I think that's, yeah, yeah. I have to bridge. There's one more step to get yeah. to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Before no, completely. I and I'll go, with, <laughs> I'll go with both questions. So the first one, I, I think there's always, each one of you will have in the back of your mind maybe something credible that you've seen either in papers, connections, papers, or, or, or gurus, business gurus. If you can connect the toolkit of consultation to that, that's great. You should do that. Everyone has the way of, of being able to connect it. And you can even redo the words in ways that you feel are most effective, right? So part of this is understanding how to translate this real, true, spiritually principle-based idea into something that'll work in business. And this is just one thing that I found that I thought, okay, because I have John Colstall's book that I've read for years, you know, about consultation, but I was like, how do I break it down to a company? Ah, I'm not seeing anything that's like, mm, you know, so I needed to kind of look for one. And so Dr. Kayvon Gula's way of doing this just made me feel really good. And then I adapted it a little bit, but it allowed me to break it down so that we can ex extrapolate what the principles are in actual practicality. So, so, um, that's one thing. The other one about love, I would say the, the closest principle that I think gets there without maybe talking about the word love, because, you know, we're often told, you know, be, don't talk about it, just be, and people feel this energy. But I, I bring it up in, in discussions, and I've spoken to law firms and to lawyers um, in many different seminars, but the concept of authenticity. And authenticity to me is connecting with your inner spiritual voice and be, be, being able to connect your heart and mind and then being able to have the bravery and courage to put that out there. So to me, that's the easiest way I have found for skeptical lawyers. And believe me, nobody wants to talk to 300 lawyers at a time. And I've had to do it. The eyes not anywhere close to where I would hope them to be. It's just like, okay, you know, but trying to get it out when I talk about authenticity, that allows them a bridge to kind of get closer to the heart. Whereas other people, I may use the word love. Other people, I may just use, you know, do you care enough about the mission to really go into this a little bit deeper? You know, because it's not, it's not black and white, right? Our heart is something interconnected with probably everything we do. But when we find that there's a large disconnect, then we should kind of, you know, maybe try to cultivate something there and try to hit something that someone cares about in, in translating it to someone else, right? How do you find that thing that brings it to the heart versus just to the mind? And that's something I think is, is all of our challenge in in doing so but it, it can certainly work but i had a question actually on um if um uh, because i used to work at some point in the european commission 
and the system over there is very rigid. And um, I was in this in this team where uh, the man management was saying something, and everybody was just doing it, and nobody was happy. Uh, people had ideas, but you know, none of this was actually uh, brought up because people were scared. People didn't, you know, it was the, the culture. The culture was like this. When you're in this kind of environment, how, you know, how do you try and in, in you know make people. Um, understand that consultation could be a way for a way forward is there actually hope or is it just completely you know that's it and move to somewhere else because there's nothing else that we can do uh, so i was just interested to hear uh, i was at, i don't really know the answer to it but i can tell you a suggestion that i heard that i found was really compelling i was at a an impact retreat conference um maybe about right before covid happened and we we're talking about people who are constantly excluded the minorities, women, people of color, and how there's often a, an assumption that the voice that they have is not as valued as let's say the white male, right? So one of the tricks was to have a pre-discussion to make sure you have three people, one person to ask a question, another to confirm, and a third to bring it up again. And by having three people in a group of let's say 50, it changes the dynamic. So I, I thought that was really interesting. I've never tried it myself, but I could imagine it to be effective because it doesn't take a lot to steer the, the conversation. So if you have some colleagues who want to try an experiment of maybe another way, have coffee with them, talk about it, and maybe see if, <laughs> if, if a new idea can happen.